Hi, welcome to On the Purple Couch podcast, The Creative Life, hosted by Bahia Akira, the owner of On the Purple Couch, located in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm excited to introduce to you all today the very talented and very business savvy author of In the Company of Women and founder of the blog Design Sponge, Miss Grace Balney. Grace and I will have the opportunity to talk about business, women, what it means to be a woman business owner, why business women are important to the economy, and what it means to see yourselves in other business owners. Grace's book, In the Company of Women, starts off with the theme from a quote by Marion Wright Edelman that says, you cannot be what you cannot see. With that, I'm going to launch into the conversation. Please share this podcast, leave an honest review, and check us out whenever you're in the D.C. area. Hit us an email or check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and all the other social media outlets. This is Bahia, and I welcome you to On the Purple Couch, The Creative Life with Grace Bonnie as our guest. Hello on the Purple Couch family. I am very excited um, to welcome a very, um, I will say, amazing woman that I have just had the opportunity to meet. I have met her through her book um, last year. Many of you guys know that we did um, a creative meetup and we used the book in the company of women. So this morning for the On the Purple Couch podcast, I have the opportunity to interview Grace Boney the author of In the Company of Women. She is um, also the founder of an amazing blog, uh, Design Sponge. Many of you may know that, which was started in 2004. Uh, it is important to note that she's a New York Times bestseller, writer, blogger. Uh, she started her business in Brooklyn and now is um, uh, in upstate New York. She'll tell us more about that. Um, but I just want to introduce you guys to Grace. Grace, welcome. Hi, I'm so excited to talk. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. Um, I, everybody, I'm using this new um, program to, to grace, so I hope that everything works and is recording as it should be. It says it is. So, Grace, we're going to get right into it. Guys, I want to talk about the book. I want to talk about women in business. I want to talk about some aspects of the book, and then I'm going to ask Grace about what she sees as next steps. If you haven't gotten the book, please do get the book, In the Company of Women. It is a compendium of 100 makers, artists, women, and uh, they're going to talk about their life. Oh, excuse me. They talk about their life, their business, and different aspects of it. I'm going to talk to Grace now and ask her some questions about the book. Um, I'm a little nervous, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead. Grace, what did you want to communicate in the book? And um, do you feel like you accomplished that? Tell us a little bit about the book. Sure. So In the Company of Women started off as a project that was a sticky note on my desktop, um, and it just said bold women. And I was making a list of people that I looked up to for totally different reasons and totally different communities from like rock stars to poets to people who are architects. And they were kind of, I think the, um, the author and speaker Brene Brown uses this, this phrase all the time about like her, her cabinet of like inspirations or something. And it was kind of an imaginary group of people that when I was feeling frustrated or uninspired or having a tough moment, I would kind of think about these different women and why they inspired me. And I just kept that list going. And I actually pitched it as a book a few years before I started working on the book and nobody was interested in it. And this was probably 2014 maybe. Um, and everyone was kind of like, yeah, I don't, you know, that's not, that's not a topic that I think people are going to buy from you because you're coming from design. And if you want to talk about business, that's just really not a big connection. So it took a while to get that idea to hit. And it wasn't until I had actually signed on to do a DIY book with my publisher. And I was at the end of my deadline for the publisher for that book. And I hadn't written the book and I wasn't, my heart was not in it. And I wrote my publisher and I said, I'm prepared to give my advance back. Um, I'm really sorry. And I just, my heart's not in this, but here's this idea that I am into. What do you think? And I was really fortunate. And my publisher was like, yes, we love it. We're ready for that. Now you have the same deadline. So if you can do this in two months, 
be our guest. And so I did. And wow. with the help of, I mean, this was, this book was a community effort of reaching out to women all across the globe. Um, who, many of whom I had no contact with or no connections to, which was a really humbling and very important process for me to go through um, of reaching out to people and just seeing if they would be a part of this. And it kind of grew into this project that I think there was a hole in the, the business world where there weren't stories about a women running businesses. There weren't stories about women from all different backgrounds. It was very often the same, same like thin white under 40 woman running a VC run company who had, you know, money from parents, money from other people. And it was just the same story being told over and over again. And I wanted there to be this like encyclopedic answer to that to say, hey, there's more than one type of woman running business. There's more than one type of path to business. And there are many different forms of business that need to be appreciated and acknowledged as businesses. Like not everybody has several million dollars in VC funding. But that doesn't mean you're not a, a business. So I kind of just wanted to represent that in the book. I um, very much appreciated that aspect of the book, um, and it was uh, very important. I just want to make sure I'm recording. I, think. Um, I really enjoyed that aspect of the book, that I could basically see a whole plethora of women. I had an experience in the shop once um, at, on the Purple Couch in Kensington. I had a little girl come in the shop, and of course the shop had lots of colors and everything. And she walked in with her mom, as many of the shoppers did. And she said, luckily I had my friend who was there to witness this. She said, are you the boss of all of this? <laughs> her face, I mean, her face just lit up. And I looked at my friend and I looked at the mom and we both almost broke down because we realized the young girl, she was six, seven, eight, and she saw something we don't know what she saw, but she saw something that touched her that was like, you can do this. And a young child that's not tainted by anything in this world, but she saw something and who knows what she would do with that. One of the things I love, Grace, is the format of the book. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, different women, um, a page or two, awesome pictures and questions. The questions don't always repeat. Some of them repeat. How did you develop the format for this book? for the interviews. So that was a collaboration as well. Um, I knew I wanted to have a pretty standard set of interview questions. Um, in my experience, I mean, it's great to be able to customize questions for individual people. And that's what I typically do on the, at Design Sponge. But there was something about, I wanted to kind of bring out the universal threads and universal themes that all people in business and especially women experience. And I found that was better done through sort of a consistent set of questions. So I worked together with um, Kelly Keeler, who's our team manager at Design Sponge. And we went back and forth and back and forth about questions and themes we wanted to cover. We looked through every single business interview we'd ever done at Design Sponge to kind of figure out what were the questions that we felt got the most raw or honest answers. What were the questions that got the biggest response from the audience? And then we incorporated those. And then I made two sets of standard questions. One for women who ran pretty standard businesses where they were the boss with several employees and then people who ran sort of solo practices. So potters and painters and people like that who aren't overseeing a team, but still are very much running businesses. And that's how we broke down the question process. I think it was excellent. I love, um, I love the questions. Oh, you know. thanks. I'm so glad. Yeah, I really do. The first one, one of the ones that stands out to me is what did you want to be as a child? You know, I wanted to be an air hostess. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so seriously, I, I did. And, and the reason is so clear. My parents were divorced early on and they were separated, of course, from, for, you know, as most divorces, you start off as a separation. You know, as a woman now, I understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. But at the time, my dad was in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, which is the Ivory Coast in West Africa. And my mom had left and gone to Liberia. Mm -hmm. And I was shuttled literally maybe once a month. Oh, wow. Oh, every two. I mean, it was so frequent. I was back and forth on Air Afrique at the time, yeah. which was the airline. And this is in the 80s. Yeah. And I was, I flew on a company minor. Oh, wow. And I would hang out with the, the, the air hostess. And that's what I wanted to be. And of course, it relates to nothing I'm doing today. But that question tied me back to my youth and sort of yeah. what was happening to me 
as a young girl and now as a woman, you know? Yeah, but that's so funny. I see the connection immediately when you said that. Oh, really? I immediately thought when I think of an air, an air hostess or just a, a flight attendant, I immediately think of someone whose job it is to like help you feel safe, help you feel guided mm. and get place. And I think about what you're doing and how you're, and when we were talking before we were recording about the experiences you had in your shop and helping people have these moments and guiding them, not just about purchases, but just about decisions in life and these meetup groups you had, you're still, you're getting people safely from one conversation to another or one point of their life to another. That's, it's the same thing to me. I love that. Like, thank you for making that connection. I did. <laughs> now I can tell my husband I'm not really a flake. He thinks I'm all <laughs> over the place. There is a connection. <laughs> There's a thread. There, there was, and everybody's answers were, I mean, interestingly, so many people fall into two categories. They either, so many people were some form of performer. They wanted to be a dancer. Mm. They wanted to be an actress or people who were like renegades, people who wanted to be cowboys, astronauts, yes. like all of these things. And it really, those two aspects are very big parts of running a business. No matter what type of business you run, there is always an element of performance. You are the face of your business. You are the person who has to speak on behalf of the business. And then you have to be brave to open and start your own business. Even I think so many people don't own and claim that bravery, but it is a big thing. And whether or not you realize you're courageous, you have to be to take a risk like that because there is a lot of risk involved in starting a business. So I loved seeing those threads because to me, they just, they made so much sense. Yeah, it is a huge risk. And especially during this time, this economic time, yes. um, and we'll get to that point, but as um, a brick and mortar um, person, uh, shopkeeper, sweeping the floor, cleaning the toilet. I mean, literally, yeah. you can't be too cute to do any of that <laughs> no, not um, at all. and still smile when people are asking you all the questions yeah. and still in Liberia, they say, hold your heart. Yeah. You still have to hold your heart when you have issues at home, yeah. but you still have to perform. Yep. You still have to give the customers what they want. Yeah. Yeah. What was there any particular criteria you focused on in selecting the interviewees? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, I would say 70% of the people in the book were came from that running list I'd had um, on my computer. And then I would say the last sort of 15 or 20 people that were in there were, were very much about recognizing, oh, I, I often respond to the same type of business at the same stage because I'm kind of in this middle stage of my business where I'm not new anymore, but I'm definitely not like 40 years in. So I kept responding to people who were kind of midway through their career. And at a certain point I was like, there need to be more stories that are people at the beginning stage and people who are much further along. So I made sure I kind of like tweaked and edited the list at that point to make sure that we weren't just talking to people who had 10 years under their belt. We were talking to people who had one year or people who had 40 or 50 years. Um, and that kind of diversity of, of business lifespan was something that was really important to me, as well as age and race and sexuality and all the different kind of identifiers that exist in human beings. I wanted there to try to be as many entry points as possible for people to see themselves reflected in some way or another, whether it was their type of business or the particular pitfall that somebody went through. And that's why I thought it was so important to ask people about about failure and I think people have a very strong reaction to that word and I don't think of failure as a negative thing it's obviously a difficult thing to go through but everybody falls down multiple times over and over in their careers and I think it's really important to talk about those things because it's a great equalizer and it's important to see that somebody who's been in business for 30 plus years still has moments where things don't work out or they second guess themselves or where the market changes and it's important to talk about those things. So for me, that was an equally important thread in people kind of connecting to these stories was to be able to see that we're all in the same boat, even if we come from very different backgrounds and have very different businesses. I think that is a very uh, salient point and a point I found in my business and the point of community, which is lifted up so much in here. We're going to get to that. I want to read this quote from your introduction. You quote, I mean, your first line, you pick a heavy hitter. You pick um, the activist Marion Wright Edelman, and you say, you can't be what you can't see. You can't be what you can't see. And this, this thread, I believe, is all the way down. It goes all the way. It goes for boys and girls and women and men. You have to be able to, be, to see, to engage. Um, and so, so I, I really like that. Um, 
in the book, I, I read, not in the book, but in, in some of your, your interviews, I read that you had two months to write the book and you flew all around the country to, how did you, how does that work? <laughs> how does that work logistically? Like, I can't fathom that. It's so funny. It was when this book happened, my wife, Julia, was like a little skeptical because she was like, A, you hate flying. B, you're not, you're not good at talking to people you don't know. <laughs> and she was like, are you really going to be up for being away from home for like two solid months? Because if I have to go to the city for one day, I get like all thrown off my, my pace. Um, but this was so much fun and so important that I did not mind being gone for like a solid two months. And we didn't fly everywhere because obviously like there was no way for me to get to Lagos at the same time that I was going to get right. to California in the same week. Right. So we hired people, um, photographers in different countries or places we couldn't get to. But um, I think naturally the book kind of sorted itself into a few large metropolitan areas, which in hindsight, I wish I'd had more time to kind of delve into more rural communities. And that's something I'm trying mm. to improve upon with our next print project. But in two months, we got to as many places as possible and then hired as many photographers as possible to do the cities that we couldn't get to. Um, but it was really important for me to be at as many of these as humanly possible. And I'm, I'm so glad I was because honestly, I didn't, I'm so glad the book did well, but the process of making the book was the best part for me. Um, and just getting to talk to people face to face, not only who were like heroes of mine, but just to hear people answer these questions in person was so moving because a lot of people had answers I never expected um, or just that were so different than what I thought they would be, but in really important ways. So um, with the photographer, Sasha Israel, we just basically hopped on a plane and, and Sasha was in the process of moving from New York to Boston and just literally was flying out of a different airport constantly because she didn't have like a steady home base. And we were just, we just gave up our lives for two months and right. did this amazing project, but it was such an honor and such a gift to do that. One of, um, one of the uh, aspects of the book I love are the quotes that lead into everybody's statement. And I don't know what it is about quotes, but I'm going to read one of my favorites, which I used last year in a very difficult time in my life. And I put it on Instagram and it's from Jody um, Patterson. She goes, my best asset cannot be measured or copied or calculated. It's my mojo. I always laid that on the table first. And I was like, yes, you know, you can learn, you can have everything, but there's something that's different about you. Jody is a font of wisdom. Um, she's an incredible human being and I mean, that was the, the really interesting part was seeing how all these women, which together, I mean, to me, there's this thread of confidence that runs through everybody. It's expressed very differently. But um, Jody was someone who really was able to, for me, tell the story of how important it was to embrace exactly who you are. Um, and not despite of certain things about you, but because of certain things about you. And I think so often women in business are told like, oh, well, maybe you're, you're too quiet or you're too whatever. And it's always this, it's too much. Or it's like, you're, you're, you're getting by in spite of something. And I felt like Jody's story was so much about like, no, no, no. Those things that make me, me are the things that are not just assets, but these are the things that are great about me. These are the things I should be proudest of. And I thought that was so beautiful. And that's something she drives home constantly. I mean, she's spoken everywhere. She spoke at the HRC. She gave a TED talk. Like she is just a phenomenal human being. One of the things I get from your book are the importance of women in business. So I want to ask you, and maybe an obvious or not so obvious question, why is it important for women to engage in the business world as entrepreneurs or as glass ceiling breakers or whatever aspect? Why is it important for us to be at the table, if you will? I mean, I think the simple answer of that is for the future. I think not only for the future generation of young people coming up to see strong women and positions of leadership and see them being confident and defining themselves not by the way they look or dress, but by what they bring to their community and to the world at large. Um, I think the more women in business, in particular, the more women of color in business we have, the better able we'll be to improve the equity in the country from every la layer of who gets business mortgages, who gets real estate, who gets venture capital funding. I mean, all of these things that are very much skewed towards older white men need to be distributed more fairly among everyone. And I think that until women represent a larger percentage of businesses, these large governmental decisions that affect all of us are going to continue to favor one very tiny percentage of the population, which is very frustrating. Um, 
I, but I, I just, I think the story you told before we were talking about a little girl coming into the shop and kind of being so amazed that you got to oversee everything in that store. Mm -hmm. I just want to create more moments like that. And it doesn't necessarily need to be just women, but I would like younger people to see all of the different ways that you could be in the world that would make you feel good about yourself and proud. And that there are so many different paths. And the thing that really hurt my heart, but was so nice to just kind of air out and talk about with the book was how many women in particular who were parents really struggled with, well, I'm not a real business owner because this is a side business I run, or this doesn't contribute 100% of my income. And to see them tamp down their success and their passion and what they do was really heartbreaking. But then to see them all talk together and to kind of build themselves back up to realize this was a, a feeling that a lot of parent working parents had, but how important it was to acknowledge that a business doesn't have to bring in all of your income to be a valid, important and successful business. So I think it's just, you know, the business world and the world in general is a better one when there's more women in leadership positions. Thank you for those thoughts. I appreciate that. One of the themes that came through um, lots of the um, interviews and responses of the women was the sense of community, the need of community. How does having community for a woman business owner make a difference? I can tell you for me, Grace, um, having the networks that I belong to, um, my networks from, you know, in D.C., my networks around the country with women who were doing the same type of business, selling paint like I was, um, my chamber of commerce, um, my husband, who's also a business owner. Um, but having all those different communities were so essential to me. Um, how, how do you find, how have you found that it has made a difference? In so many ways. I, the first thing that comes to mind is accountability. Um, I think uh, yes. it's, that's kind of just a big word for me these days is, is trying to create safe, honest spaces, which doesn't always mean easy, but honest spaces where I had people I can trust that I can talk to about not just business, but life in general, and to try to figure out if these are my goals, or this is what I want to do or be or experience in life. Somebody to be like, hey, remember when you said you wanted to do that? Like, maybe you should follow through on it, or how can I help you follow through? And I think that community is both about accountability, but it's also about support. And I think everybody goes through moments where they really need that person to kind of lean against and sometimes it's a group of people and you need someone to lift you up when it could be as simple as like, Hey, I'm just, I'm not feeling like my business is doing that great. I need someone to remind me that, Hey, I'm actually doing a really great job. And here are all the different things I should be proud of. Sometimes you just need that simple type of support. Sometimes you need somebody to jump in and be like, Hey, yeah, you have this order that you can't fill and you need people to show up at your house and help you box things and mail them. That's what your community right. can help you with. I mean, from every different layer. And then that, that always crosses into the personal and becomes real friendships. But creating real community like that, where people feel respected and valued and can be honest, it's a lot of work. And I think that that's something that a lot of people, including myself, are really just realizing how much work goes into creating a safe, honest community. But good Lord, how valuable that is and how important that work is to do. I mean... That to me feels like the most important work ever right now because businesses come and go, they go through different iterations, personal relationships change, like, but having this place to come back where you can be honest and open with each other, those things last forever. Yeah, yeah. Um, you talk about businesses coming and going, ups and downs. There are so many aspects, um, especially for women, that affect our business. Um, uh, from our roles at home, our roles in the community, the different groups, associations we belong to, religious and otherwise, mm -hmm. sororities and so forth, uh, book clubs and so forth, and then running a business and partnerships and so forth. It, to me, Grace, you spent since 2004 with Design Sponge, founding it. You started this in Brooklyn. You started it as a hobby. It is an amazing website. You've written another book. Um, your first book, All on Design, you've uh, shared so much about design. But now you, you're, you realize you had a platform. You, you created a platform, a, a platform came out of your work. You know, when did you realize this platform that you were building was more, was, was more than just about design? I think, I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty, And so I think that when I look back at that first book, which was in 2011, I think, which was Design Sponge at Home, 
I think in hindsight, that was the end of Design Sponge as designed for me. Um, I felt it at that time. I remember like holding that book in my hands and it was not a fun process to make. I really didn't enjoy it. And I thought I would never do another book again. And looking at it and it felt like this yearbook of what the first, what was that, seven, seven years of Design Sponge had been. And I was like, this perfectly encapsulates the aesthetic that I was obsessed with, the people, like everything about Design Sponge and that early identity felt encapsulated in that book. And I, I remember at that point feeling like I'm done. I, this, this was everything I wanted. I got to write a book. I got to go on a book tour. This was so cool. I'm done. Like I don't, I don't have anything else to say about this community. And at that point, so many other home blogs were up and running and thriving and telling different points of view. And I just didn't think it felt that necessary to go on. And so, I mean, almost every year since that year, <laughs> I've thought about closing the site. And I think that that was the year where I realized, okay, if I'm going to keep doing this, there needs to be a new purpose. There needs to be a changed purpose and not one that's better or worse, but just one that's different. And I looked around and I was like, well, what's missing? What's different? Like the, the world of independent design has a home in many different places now. So I don't need to be a platform for handmade work. Like that's having its moment. Um, and I just realized I was far more fulfilled and intrigued by the people behind design. And I still have always just am fascinated by creative people and who make a living doing something with their hands. And so I started to talk about the people and their stories and their challenges more than the stuff. And that felt fulfilling. And so I just followed that feeling and it became the biz lady series that I did. It became, um, just the life and business column on the site. It became the podcast that I ran for two years. And I kind of just followed that without a plan, which is just the story of my life. I just don't plan anything because I'm just not good at that. And so I just kind of followed that feeling. And then I, I don't think it was until probably, so I did in the company of women and what year was that? Um, 2016 or 2015. So I think it's probably like 2013 was when I started realizing like, okay, I'm fulfilled by this type of content, but what does my site look like? Yes, it includes this content, but there are some big things that are missing. Like I'm having these conversations, but I'm having them with the same type of people. And those people look like me and have the same background that I do. And this is problematic. And it was definitely not just me feeling that. It was people that I worked with. It was people in my community. And they started calling me out both publicly and privately and saying like, yeah, I'm glad you're talking about these things, but you're only talking to white people. You're only talking to people who already have money. You're only talking to people who've been in business for X amount of years or people who've already gotten a ton of press. Like, why aren't you talking about people who don't look like this and sound like this? And I was so defensive, like so many of us are, um, and just had this moment of like seizing up. And I'm so thankful that several women in my community kind of sat me down and were like, okay, you've had your moment to feel defensive. You need to grow from this. You need to figure out what you're doing wrong and fix it. Just start fixing it. And so I think around 2013 was when I started to look at my team differently, the content we produced and without like making a big announcement, it just became kind of a mission to focus more on inclusivity. And that was not just an easy change it, because I had done absolutely nothing to generate goodwill among communities of color, even among my own LGBT community. Like I hadn't done a good job of representing them or telling their stories or giving them a platform to tell their own stories in their own voices. And I had a lot of work to do to make up for that. And so I spent years just trying to listen, to talk less, to support and be a part of communities where I hadn't been a very good member of them. And it took years and years of that kind of work to slowly be able to share stories where people felt trusted and supported. And so the website kind of became, and it's very much still evolving um, into a platform that better welcomed and represented all members of our community. And that kind of just naturally led into the book of, okay, well, now we know these people and their stories, and I think they feel a little bit safer to share them with us. And that kind of just became the book. Got you, got you, got you. Um, that is a lot. And that was, that had to have been, I mean, you said it, I'm going to use the word painful. I'm not sure if that's what you're saying, but that is a process to take one through any type of shifts, yeah. whatever segment or, or aspect they're coming from can be painful. Um, as many people know, we closed our shop in October and, um, I had actually just come back from South Africa and I knew, and I had known for some time, 
that I really needed to pivot with the shop. I had known for a while and I had to convince myself and I was resistant. I was resistant to people talking to me saying, look, this is affecting you in X, Y, and Z ways. You know, your health, your family, you know, brick and mortar is changing. Um, we financed our business ourselves, which means we did everything you're not supposed to do. You know? um, and, you know, spent money that sometimes we had, sometimes we didn't have. Um, had to reach out for help for friends. I mean, I have a core of friends that I'd be like, look, I need a little bit of, and they were there. Um, so there was a time of, there was a time of shifting that I had to make. And I think for women in business, there are those times. Sometimes we ignore them. Grace, how can one recognize when there is, when, when a shift is coming, when it's time to pivot, when it's time to, to, you got to take that, it's time to get off. It, honestly, it's a really hard thing to do. I think that pivots come in different forms. Sometimes they're easier ones. Sometimes they're life-changing, like you're talking about with like ending a business and starting a new form of that. That's a really big, scary, and financially scary thing to do. Um, for me, I always know that pivot is coming. I, I feel like everyone's got that voice in their head that's saying like, something's not quite right here. Something's not fulfilling enough. Like, I, I most often recognize it when I start getting frustrated with other things about my community. And that's me projecting my discomfort onto other people and being like, "Ugh, why aren't other people talking about this? Or why isn't this happening? Or why isn't this happening? And that's never anyone else's fault. It's me being uncomfortable and just projecting that outward because it's too uncomfortable to sit with the idea that, oh, it's my job to change and pivot to whatever that next thing is where I'm going to feel more fulfilled. And I honestly kind of have to be pushed until the very last moment to make those changes usually. Um, and I think it's worth noting that those changes are sometimes ones that are just a lot easier to make when you have money and privilege and access and friends and not everybody has that. So I see a lot of people write about like pivot points and career changes as if they're these very easy things to do. And I think that people need to cut themselves a ton of slack because I mean, I've seen some of my favorite people in business talk about like, well, everyone should take a year off to figure out what that next project is. And I was just like, are you kidding me? Like who has a year to sit and just not make any money and to be able to casually plan their next step? Like that's just not how most people work. So I think that's where community comes in again. And I've, I've had friends say like, you've been talking about this for a year. Maybe you should do something about it. And I think it's helpful to have people point out when you are kind of a broken record about certain aspects of your business or the community or whatever you're having problems with and to kind of nudge you and say like, hey, sounds like you're ready for a change. How can we help? And I think that's where a community is so important and that community can be family, friends, other business owners, whatever it is. But I think everybody hears that pivot point happening. It's just, it's scary to turn the key and just say like, okay, I'm taking that step. I'm going to take the risk, but that's where community can help you make it feel less risky. Whether they're helping you with like, I need some help with rent money this month, or I need some help, you know, getting promotion out or contacts to figure something out. Like that's where community can help it feel a little bit less scary. Yeah, I can appreciate that. And that's definitely very real. As we sort of wrap up the interview, I wanted, I have two more questions. Um, what advice do you have for creatives or business women right, women right now in this 2018? Um, there's a lot going on. The retail, that's my background, the retail world has and is going through like some serious ups and downs, lots of downs. Um, blogs are changing, as you said. Um, the way people interact is changing. Facebook is changing and it's going to impact a lot of us who promote on Facebook as business owners. Know that pain point. <laughs> um, there's a lot of change. What advice? I mean, you clearly are, I mean, you've been in the game for a while, so you have seen some trends in the business world and you have made several shifts and pivots. Um, what advice might you give to, or, or thoughts you might have either on trends or, or themes for 2018? Um, I think the biggest and the scariest thing which everyone is feeling, which you mentioned with Facebook, is that social media is no longer functioning the way it did when we all kind of fell in love with it. Um, it's no, the algorithms that exist now are just transparently about trying to hold back publisher content. So whether you are a small independent blog or a huge brand like Pepsi or something, 
every social platform is going to kind of hamper your and hold back your content in favor of individuals. So the power that businesses used to have to be able to use social media to promote, I mean, it is overnight just tanked. And I mean, I think we reach at the most like 6% of our audience at this point. And even when we've briefly like categorized ourselves as a business on social media and then paid to promote, the numbers were even worse. So mm -hmm. social media, which is, it's, to be honest, it's really scary, but I'm not sure what's going to happen. Because I think that when we've seen the death, the death of net neutrality and we're seeing, you know, algorithms and things that just purposely try to hinder businesses, it's, it's scary. I have no idea what the next tool mm -hmm. is going to be that helps businesses promote. But I can tell you the thing that I'm feeling right now and that you and I have kind of touched on a lot for the past like half hour is just how important face-to-face -face connections are going to be. And I think that it's so important to maintain this kind of vast network of online connections we have that allows us to connect with people in different countries and different cities and different businesses. But I think at the end of the day, people are, are having a better and easier time investing in things that happen in person. I think we are increasingly see the internet become a place where people do not pay for things. And I think whether it's, you know, reading the New York Times online or paying for a blog, people don't associate good quality internet content with money. I think that it's just something that you assume should be free because that's how most of it started. And, but, and so, and so while I think a lot of us who are content producers on, online or want to promote our content online really struggle with, well, how the heck do we get this out here without paying? Or how do we get access to the people who've chosen to follow us? And I don't know what the answer is yet, but I do know that people are showing up to buy books, to buy magazines, to go to workshops, to meet with people face to face. I think that is the very real backlash to how much we live online is people are willing to pay to actually connect with people in person. And so I don't think that means everyone should go out and charge people to meet in person, but I think that there is this wave of people who would just prefer to connect face to face. And so if that means you have the ability to teach a class or start a meetup group or, you know, open a shop that still has an online component, but also has a brick and mortar location, I think that some combination of on and offline is, is yeah. going to become a big trend for 2018 mm -hmm. and forever, because I think people are very much reacting to the fact that, a lot of the connections we make on the internet are not sustainable, meaningful ones. They are like very surfacey and up here. And when things go wrong, those aren't the people that are going to be there for you as much as the people who you know in person. So I really think that percentage of online versus off is going to start to become a lot more even and maybe even tip towards in person. Wow. I hope you're right because <laughs> me too. I'm serious because for somebody like me, I, I live for people. I live, you know, at a, at my son's birthday party, or a child's birthday. I'm sitting down talking. I'm like, you can do whatever you want. I just want to talk to people. Yeah. I want to touch people. I want to see people. Yeah. Grace, you have been incredibly generous with your time uh, and having access to you like this. It's amazing to me. Um, I thank you very much. Um, I wonder, and this is my last question, I wonder, what is next um, for Grace? What is, uh, <laughs> if we dare ask you, and if you even dare trust us to tell us, oh, what is I, next I, for you? I, God, I wish I had a good juicy answer. Um, <laughs> I think it's interesting that you said for Grace and not Design Sponge, because I, I think that the future, I think Design Sponge is coming to a close. And I don't think that that's like a, I mean, like this is a thing that most, I think most bloggers would be like, no, you can't ever say that. But Design Sponge has been in this kind of slow, going to sleep mode for a while now. And I think that blogs, I mean, for the reasons we just talked about are really struggling and we are not immune to that. And we don't have venture capital money. We don't have any, right. any type of funding other than advertising. And I, I think that as a team, we've been keeping ourselves afloat with the book, with print projects, with stuff that happens in person and making money through the way we used to make money online. is just literally just really not an option anymore, unless we just want to constantly bathe ourselves in sponsored content and only use products and clothing that people pay us to do. And that for me doesn't feel, doesn't feel good. So we're not doing that. Um, and I don't begrudge anybody for doing that because that works for a lot of people. It's just doesn't feel good to me. So I don't want to do that. So I think I really struggled with, do I just close the website? But I, but I love, I love having that place to talk to people. I think for me, the next chapter is figuring out a, how do I become comfortable and happy with, dealing with a much smaller percentage of that 
platform, but being able to talk about things that are more important to me because I've tried really hard to kind of steer the design sponge ship in a different direction and our readers are not really going for it. And they just want to hear about houses and they don't want to hear about the bigger issues that are behind real estate or anything like that. So I think I need to find a, a home where I can talk about those things that are really important to me without trying to kind of shove it down everybody else's throat. And there's a big part of me that's still just really disappointed that I can't get people to care about the social or social justice or economic issues behind all the pretty things we like to talk about. But I think that's okay. It's just design sponge was never built that way. And that's, I'm responsible for that. Like I didn't build it as a platform where we talked about those deeper issues. And so I think people want it to be a distraction. So I think I need to let it be what it is. Mm -hmm. And I need to take those discussions to other places like the book. And we actually have a magazine coming out um, this spring, which has been a nightmare. Another project that I like was like, oh, I'll just do this because I've done a book before. And it's much harder and much different. But it's been very rewarding to realize how much work goes into magazines. Um, so we're hopefully we'll have that as a platform for at least that one issue um, to talk about much deeper things. And we're going to, the whole first issue's theme is community. So Ooh. we're talking about like these incredible female led communities. We're talking about women who are, you know, with their own two hands, changing the way their community is perceived or received. And we're talking about community health, both mental and physical. And so I'm really excited to have those deeper conversations. And I hope that print continues to be a place where we can do that. That is amazing. Um, congratulations on the magazine. I, I am still into magazines and so are so many people. I, so. hope, I, hope, I hope enough percentage is there to get us a second issue, but we'll see. I know, I know. These I know. Days, like if you get to do one, that's At least good. you've done it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, platforms are, are just that. They are platforms. And I feel like a platform is like you're walking to, and then you're walking to another. Yeah. And so with Design Sponge, you know, it got you here. Yeah. It, it's solidly, solidly. And then to the next step and to the next step. So as we shared earlier, you know, we're all ever growing, ever shifting. Uh, and thank God for that. I, I thank God for growth. Um, so, so with that, Grace, thank you so much for your time. Thanks um, for having me. I appreciate it. And on the Purple Couch family, please check out In the Company of Women, Grace Boney. Thank you so much. I'm going to press stop recording right now. <laughs>